Shop a kendo star if you want me to keep making videos. <laughs> See, can't skip that one. Right. <laughs> Hi folks and welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. I've got fantastic uh, questions today and we've got loads of them. Loads and loads and loads, we've even got pictures. So uh, we're gonna fire through them today. We're gonna get through them as fast as we can. Um, so yeah, you might have to put this video on half speed or something like that, because I'm gonna be talking fast. Uh, <laughs> don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that sort of thing. And as I said at the beginning of the video, because you couldn't skip it, shop at Kendo Star if you like these videos. Okay, that's what keeps these videos coming. That's what makes sure that they can keep coming. Kendostar.com, it's my website. It's the best one on the internet. If you don't believe me, look at how well we are rated. Okay, first question. Two weeks ago, I watched a video about Gakudor and the opportunity to strike uh, door. When the opponent is blocking, uh, the left hand is over the head. Is it possible to strike left kode? So when they're like blocking like this, like we talked about in the video, if you haven't seen the video that I did about Gakudo. Gakudo is when you strike the opposite side, okay? So the uh, the left side of the opponent's body <coughs> as opposed to the normal right side. Uh, and it's usually when they're blocking something like this. So what you're asking is, is whether you're also allowed to hit this kote. Uh, yes, you're allowed to hit that kote, but it's usually not that simple. Um, because of the dynamics of the situation, the, it's usually not presented very well. Um, often the underside of the kote is showing, so it's like the kote himo side. And although it's still valid to strike that, um, it's quite hard to be awarded if bon in that situation. So um, although it's it's perfectly valid, <laughs> uh, it's perfectly valid. Um, it's it's not always the um, easiest point to be awarded, if that makes sense. Next one, uh, how long should the door humor loops be after it's tied? Uh, I'm pretty big and the final loop is ridiculously short, shorter than shoelaces. Uh, I considered buying men humor and shorten them to do a reasonable length, but even then I have no idea what's reasonable. So there's no uh, particular rules or regulations on how long the loops of the door humor have to be after the tie. So that's the bit that's here, how long the, the, the loop is. Um, but you know, you know, a few centimeters or, or so is fine. If it's massive and it's sort of bouncing around, that's not good either. Um, but you know, like, a, a, you know, three or four centimeters is absolutely fine. Um, if you aren't able to get the, the most important thing is that it's not coming untied in the middle of your practice, okay? Um, so if you're still managing with the ones that you've got, um, even though they are quite small loops, it should be fine as long as they're not coming untied. But if you do feel like you want a little bit more space, then yeah, definitely um, just pick up some Menhimo and shorten them. Um, and that would be, that, be the best way to do it. Andy, last week you mentioned that we use different kinds of tenuchi with a shinai and a bokuto. Uh, perhaps uh, it'd be interesting for many for you to talk a bit about those differences. Uh, cheers, thanks, and I never miss a Kendall run. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, I'll go and get one. Oof, okay, I'm back. Uh, so I've got a, a shinai uh, and I've got a, a, a bokuto here. This is um, it's a kiddie bokuto, but the, the concept's the same. Um, right, I don't have much space on this camera. That's the problem. But, so I can get my hands in the shot. When you're striking with a shinai, let's see if I can move, all right? When you're striking with a shinai, there's this bit here, this bit, pam, this way, pam, like that, this bit, yeah? Pam, 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 that bit, okay? That's how you strike with a shinai, pam, like that, with tenuchi, okay? With a, with a bokuto though, a bokken, a bit different. See if I can show you again. <laughs> if I was making the same strike, if I was to use the bokuto in kata and strike like this, I'm gonna hit my opponent. I'm gonna hit my opponent, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to do that. So you'd be like, uh, you know, um, like I don't even have the space to do. But you maybe kata number two. You'd move out of the way, raise and tall. Yeah, tall this way. Bam, tall. Not kote this way. Not this kote, this one, this way, like this, stop, not, pam, pam, not like this, not like this, but, pam, this way, you're kind of pulling more this way rather than pushing more this way, okay, it's a sole difference, but it is different, okay, the how, way we use the bokuto and the way we use the shinai. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I know we've got a really small uh, sort of area that we can film with in my current setup, so. 
Uh, I know that every club organizes Q level gradings. Uh, but can you in general tell me what's required for passing fourth, uh, sorry, fifth, fourth and third Q level at your club or in the UK? Um, well, <clears throat> look, to be honest, um, I don't mean this in a bad way, but the difference between fifth Q and third Q is really, really small. All right. Now, I get it. Don't get me wrong. Right. When I was like starting out in Kendall, like it seemed like really big, <laughs> uh, but it's it's not all right. What the the there isn't really strict differences. Essentially, it's just it, it's too hard to say for definite. You know, well, this is the standard for third Q or second Q or fifth Q or whatever. And I know some people have tried to write it out, but at the end of the day, at those sort of levels, it comes down to the judgment of the people that are making the decision as to what they're going to grade you and whether they think, yeah, you're about sort of third Q or fourth Q. Um, essentially, it's, it's only about the sort of physical ability to make the strikes. But if you can try and make strikes with Kikentai no Ichi, so that's unifying the sword, body and spirit, um, with Fumikomi Ashi, so with actual stamping, pretty much at the same time as you make the strikes and with a good vo vocalization, then you'll be fine, whether it's for fifth cue, for fourth cue, or for third cue, um, or for first cue, or for first done. <laughs> it's essentially the same. Um, but with the cue grades, there is such a massive variance as to what gets exam. There's clubs that don't examine you wearing armor for those grades. There's some clubs that do the same sort of grading as you would do for first stand for those grades. So it's too hard for me to say specifically what it will be. But, you know, if you just follow the teachings of the basics of Kendall, um, to the best of your ability, you'll be fine. OK, it's not massively complicated. It's just following the instructions um, of the sort of basic movements. I'm sure you'll be absolutely fine. Um, next one. Is there a what right way? to correct a sensei when you know they've made an error in an explanation, like if they miss a step in the kata or use the wrong term. Most of the time, I wait, wait it out until they realize their mistake. Well, then they sometimes chastise the students for not catching it. Uh, catching it. Uh, no. <laughs> I can't really think of a, a, a sort of um, good way to correct a sensei. If like they make a mistake when they're teaching, um, at least not necessarily in front of everybody. Um, it's yeah, it could cause a really awkward atmosphere. Um, so the way I would probably handle it, if I really felt that it needed to be corrected, or if I thought that I had a good enough relationship with the sensei to make such a correction um then i would wait and sort of ask them afterwards af not in front of everybody and sort of say um and, unless of course i'm i'm assuming that they're not the sort of it's not during a situation where they're like spot the mistake you know and you have to try and find out what the mistake they made obviously that aside <laughs> um but say, you know, maybe after the practice or after that specific thing, just say, oh, sensei, do you mind if I just ask you something? Um, just before when you said this, um, I, I, you know, uh, you said that or you showed that or you did that, but someone else or I was taught this way. Um, is that, you know, which, which way is right or something like that. But, you know, try not to be, try not to make it look like you're pointing out a mistake. <laughs> Um, because you, you might be wrong, um, as well. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, uh, it could be either way. It's not that senseis don't make mistakes. They sure do. But, um, it can really look like you're being a bit of a, bit of a know-it-all if you're trying to point it out in front of everybody. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'd probably just take it a little bit. You know, and they'll probably, they'll probably just say, "What well, did I say? Did I say, oh, no, sorry, I meant to say it this way. Or, oh, I missed that step in the cut. I did. I know you should have a, oh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they think differently, you know. So, mm. you know, they, that that's in the situation where you feel that you definitely have to point it out. I mean, there's been loads of times when I've been with a, a sensei and they've said something that I, 
I thought wasn't quite right. Um, but I just kept it to myself because, I, you know, I know what I think is right. <laughs> <clears throat> Have you heard it said that some point, at some point in your Kendall, sorry, at some point your Kendall will become your Kendall. Uh, if this is a common saying, what does it mean for the from your perspective? Uh, I'm assuming this means at some point the way you practice, fight, compete will take on your own personal flavor, or for lack of a better word, whilst not diminishing the non-negotiable tenets of Kendall or core Kendall precepts. Living, operating with a healthy tension, as it were. Uh, hoping this uh, inquiry makes some kind of sense. It makes really good sense. It makes perfect sense. And I think if you haven't seen it yet, I put up a video yesterday called uh, Dojo Kendall versus Shiai Kendall. And I talked a little bit about it in that. Um, at the beginning of your Kendall career, probably up to about uh, third done at least, and including, um, Kendall is about, for the most part, uh, practicing Kihon and getting the correct form and doing things properly. Um, and it is th throughout, but after, after, after a certain point, there's a, there's a point where, um, you start to take on your own style in a way. Um, but obviously your own, your own, I mean, Kendall is kind of your, a person's character is often reflected in their Kendall and, um, that's what starts to happen at that stage. So um, the way that you sort of, you know, uh, practice Kendall or perform Kendall or perform techniques um, will, and, and the ideas you start to have about Kendall will start to sort of, start to sort of come about by themselves and you will start to have your Kendall. And that's why person A's Kendall looks different to person B, B's Kendall, even though neither of them are doing it technically wrong, or uh, you couldn't even say, well, that 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 footwork's correct and that one's not correct, or that one's better than that one, um, you because they're both right, even though they're both slightly different, because there's so many variables about that person's character, the way the person thinks, even the way the b person's built, their body, um, all these things play into how a person's individual Kendall starts to come about. But you can't start to really develop that until you've got a sort of foundation to sort of build the house on. Um, so, yeah, it is important that you learn the basics and drill the basics. And you continue to do that because if you don't continue to do that and then you start to mix in your own style, as it were, without continuing to drill the basics then you just start to go off on your own tangent and some really weird stuff starts to happen. Uh, and I have seen that before as well. And that's that it doesn't end. It doesn't work out well. Uh, next one. After watching many current Shi'ai from Japan, I've noticed that the younger competitors after Ikbon have been awarded to their opponent, walk to the starting point with their shoulders slumped and holding the Shinai lowered as if presenting Gedan no Kamae. Uh, is it possible? Uh, is it probable, sorry, that they are allowing that point to consume them emotionally? For me, I would be doing a bit of stretching in those few steps and definitely focusing my spirit back to the task at hand. Uh, is it also possible that their mental and physical maturity have not developed enough? Um, I think I understand what you're saying, but I don't think it's what you're suggesting. Um, essentially... A Kendall match is fought for the best of three points. That means the person that scores two points first wins. Or if somebody scores a point and the time, time runs out, that person wins instead. So the match, after a point has been decided, uh, it's not really the done thing to like take your time doing a bit of stretching and kind of psyching yourself up a bit before you start the next uh, not round, but the, the next, the, you know, before the Shi'ai continues. Um, and it's not the case either that, you know, you don't want to be over psyched. And I'm saying this as somebody that was, that was performing uh, competitive Kendall um, up to and including the level of the world championships. And I know from experience that when you kind of over psych yourself, like it, it doesn't go, 
in the right way. <laughs> it doesn't help. Yeah. Um, so what you don't want to do is after you've, after you've scored a point, you've been awarded a point, you don't be like, yeah, right. Okay. Let's go and do this sort of thing. Um, I mean, I know there's people that, that might help, but like, you don't see that much in Japan. Um, to be honest, uh, especially as if, if you do anything that could be considered celebrating, you can have the point removed. So instead, um, <clears throat> you tend to find that after making a, a point, most people will relax. Okay, that's one. And sort of recompose themselves. Now, that doesn't mean they have to hold their kamae. Of course, they'll release their kamae. Um, collect their thoughts as they sort of return to the kaishi sen, the, the line that you start from. Resume kamae and then start again. I don't think that it's the they are kind of consumed emotionally or um, that they're not kind of mentally developed enough to know what's going on. I think, I, I really do think it's more that they just kind of, okay, next one sort of thing. Um, that tends to be my experience anyway. Uh, next one. Hey Andy, when are you doing another Zoom session? Uh, Keiko. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, would you like me to do another one? Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, maybe I'll do another one um sometime soon uh maybe before the end of the month uh i can't do them every week I, I i do not have the time to do them every week i'd love to um but i just i i don't <laughs> um i don't have the time uh but uh <clears throat> and you know come on let's be honest like if i was doing it every week like most of you wouldn't come every week <laughs> so <laughs> uh yeah uh, I'll try and do another one uh, later this month, okay? I'll, I'll let everyone know. Uh, okay. Oh, I just put everything in bold. Didn't mean to do that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> After watching the latest video featuring uh, Yuya Takenoichi, this question came to mind. I was told that a push is Hansoku. Yet, in the video, uh, and in my experience, the person that is pushed is constantly being, consistently being penalized, even though... Uh, the push had nothing to do with an attempted strike. There's no strike or attempt to strike after the push. There's no strike or attempt to strike before the push. One of them is just a simple push to the chest, uh, while the shinai is a horizontal, uh, pushing the is pu is pushing to be penalised or not? And if yes, then when? All right. Um, so this is about a video I posted on the Kendo Style blog the other day. Um, yeah, following. Um, Yuya Takenoichi's uh, victory in the Ultraman Championships. Uh, so I know exactly what you mean. I did uh, look at the video again and I know what you're talking about. So first off, um, you were told that a push is a hand soccer. It's not a hand soccer to push your opponent, right? Um, that's, that's the first thing. Um, that being said, <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I've got the rule book here um, and I'll tell you exactly what it says about pushing. Um, it says, as soon as I can find the page. There you go, right. Um, miscellaneous prohibitions, this is where it's covered. It's on page seven if you've got the book. Uh, it's too bright, isn't it? <laughs> it's on page seven um, and it's basically... Article 17. Miscellaneous pro uh, prohibitions. Shiaisha are prohibited from engaging in the following acts. One, use of non-regulation kendo equipment. Two, tripping the opponent or sweeping their legs. Three, unfairly shoving or pushing the opponent out of the shiaijo. And four, jogai or stepping out of the shiaijo while the match is in play. Five, letting go of the shinai. Six, requesting for a suspension of the shiai without a justifiable reason. Seven, uh, committing other acts that violate the regulations. Um, so... Essentially, um, I don't think there's more. Um, the bit about pushing there is is that unfairly shoving or pushing the opponent out of the shiaijo, yeah. Um, and it says the same in Japanese. I do So, um, it's that word futo there. It means unfairly. So, you're not allowed to unfairly push the opponent out of the shiaijo. Now, there's another book that's not published in English, though. Uh, Stroud Sensei from the USA is, has done a fantastic translation, uh, and I've posted about that before as well, um, called the sort of subsidiary guidelines, the, the Shimpan Tebiki. 
Uh, and there is a mention in there where they advise that, you know, you should be careful to uh, examine whether any pushing is done um, in order solely um, with the intention of uh, sort of unfairly pushing someone out of the Shi'i jaw, or whether it's could be interpreted to be connected to some kind of waza. But also you have to take into the greater context the general uh, back and forth of, of a Shi'i. Um, now, what you saw in that video, the one particular push that you mentioned where he had the Shinai horizontally, um, for me, that was probably the only instance in that where it was sort of borderline, where I guess you could say um, it wouldn't surprise me necessarily. I wouldn't, you know, I would I'd be able to understand it if the referees had decided the other way in that they could have given the hand soccer for the push. But it's a very grey area and it relies entirely on the interpretation of the Shimpan. And I'd say that probably uh, 99 times out of 100, they would have made the same decision, um, even if you were to change the Shimpan um, in that specific case. Um, look, the idea is, is you get you get one push, all right, for, for the most part. You get, you get one push. If someone's sort of teetering at the edge of the Shi'i jaw, then you you're allowed. You, you, it's generally acceptable that you're allowed to give them give them a push. What you're not allowed to do is push them from one side of the shi jaw to the other, or push them from the middle of the shi jaw to the edge of the shi jaw, or or do things that look like you're just trying to wrestle them out of the shi jaw because you're not capable or unwilling to try and make an actual strike. Um, that's what the rule exists for, right? It doesn't exist to stop people being pushed out of the Shi'i jaw. It stops players using uh, the concept of Jorgai as a means of winning matches, um, it, but in terms of strategy. So with that context, you know, I don't think that the, the I don't think that the, the pushing in that video was unfairly judged. Uh, I think that's sort of the level that you can expect to see. And that one particular one that you mentioned where he pushes the chest, where it's sort of horizontal, um, is pretty much borderline as to how, how far you can go with it. Um, so yeah, that's that's my sort of stance on it. Uh, when I tie my door and tie it together, uh, the door himo pull down on the zekken and make an indentation. Put it picture below for reference with my kendo star door and tare. Uh, the indentation seems to stay after taking them apart and wearing the tare. Am I tying it too tightly? Um, is there an alternative way to tie the door and tie it together that doesn't involve bringing the door humor over the top, over the middle flap of the tally? Thank you. And then there's a there's a picture here that very clearly shows, very clearly shows what it is that you mean. So yeah, this is it. This is the correct way to tie up your door to your tally, um, especially for putting it in the bag uh, and for transporting it. Um, and what you're talking about is this indentation here. Um, no, uh, I mean, you could tie it a little bit looser if you wanted, but I don't think that's a problem. What I just do is when you untie it, just push the indenta indentation out. It should be fine. Um, and the, the other thing that will stop this is I'll try not to store the door and tie it like this, uh, and that'll prevent it. Um, you tie it up like this to transport it, but if you can, when you get home, open the bag, take it out of the bag, um, if you store it at home, that is, um, and untie it and then don't store it this way. Um, what most people would do is like, if you could uh, stand the door up, if you've got space and then turn the tally round. So it's the tally name is facing outwards, like like you do at the door door before you put it on uh, and sort of store it like that if you can. Um, but I wouldn't store it tied like this if you can help it. And that'll definitely help with that indentation. But in any case, uh, just before you practice, take untie it and just straighten it out with your hands. Um, and I think that'll help an awful lot. I don't, I don't think you're necessarily tying it too much. I mean, it's, it's kind of just part and parcel of it, isn't it? So... Hi Andy, I can't help but notice that you didn't mention the leather used for Tenuichi in your Borg webinar. Did I not? I thought I did. Um, <laughs> would you mind talking about the pros and cons of each kind of leather in detail, namely white disc and smoke disc and uh, synthetic leather and micro punch deer leather, uh, micro punch synthetic leather. In addition, if synthetic wool is just as flexible as deer hair while being cheaper and can be made antibacterial, is there a reason to use deer hair for the Kote Atama? Thank you. Okay, so I thought I had talked about that, but I guess I didn't. I mean, it was a long, a long webinar. Uh, yeah, so 
let's separate the there's three types of thing uh leather usually used for the cote palms one is cow leather all right like the normal leather that you use for jackets and belts and shoes and stuff like that it's total rubbish we never use it at kendo star because as soon as it gets wet starts to dry out it starts to crack it goes hard it's uncomfortable splits it rips it tears it's total rubbish um so we never use it all right so that's all i've got to say on that um then you've got um synthetic leather and you've got deer skin all right deer skin is fantastic it feels really nice it's really soft it's much more durable than uh cow skin um and you know it, it, it does have a nicer feel to it um the bleached one <clears throat> i tend to the bleached white one i tend to find feels softer than the smoked one um, and it doesn't have the smell. Some people don't mind the smell of the smoked deer skin. In fact, some people really like it. I personally am not a massive fan of it. So I prefer uh, the white uh, bleached leather, which is why we use that on most of our uh, Borg sets that have the uh, deer skin leather. Um, and like I say, I do think it, it feels nicer. And I, I actually tend to find it being a bit more durable because it tends to have a little bit more stretch to it. That's just my own personal experience. Haven't done any sort of in-depth analysis on that. Um, synthetic leather um, or synthetic deer skin, um, is, it's really quite durable. It doesn't feel quite as nice as the uh, the general the regular deer skin. Um, it's probably a little bit more durable, but it's not a massive, you know, if you're not... If you're not sort of using the, the same cote for four or five times a week, you wouldn't have a massive um, noticeable difference in terms of durability. Uh, but it does allow you to have a sort of uh, uh, more reasonably priced uh, material for the cote. You definitely use it over the cow skin um, because it's, it's still nice and stretchy. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's perfectly comfortable um, and I, I don't mind using it at all. Uh, the micro punch stuff, uh, I used that for a while, uh, about four or five years ago. Um, I don't like it. Um, it's 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 a clearly clearly less durable than uh, the ones without the micro punch. Um, yeah, it dries a bit faster, but it tears up real fast. The thing about synthetic leather is it's like fibrous, so. Um, as it sort of starts to rub, especially against the shinai, um, the, the fibers that it's made up of start to sort of peel away. Um, so you'll see that with synthetic leather that's been used for a while, it sort of starts to peel a bit. Now, if it's right, regular synthetic leather without the holes in it, it doesn't tend to be a massive problem um, because it's quite thick. So it still lasts fine, even if it does sort of peel a little bit, which you don't get with the deer skin. Um, the problem is though, is when you start to get the holes in it, right, it's generally thinner and um, as it starts to peel, the holes start to get bigger and it starts to, to rip. And I just don't like it. I don't like it. And that's why you don't see us use it at all. Um, so yeah, uh, about synthetic wool, I would, it, it's too much of a blanket statement to say it's just as flexible as deer hair. Um, some of it is, more modern ones are, but some others aren't, all right? So if you get like really cheap and nasty cote you'll get from not Kendo Star, but other suppliers. Um, <laughs> they might use some like really rubbish cotton wool in there uh, to save the costs um, and you will not find them as flexible as deer hair. Um, definitely not. Um, but the sort of uh, more modern ones that, yeah, like say antibacterial and stuff like that, um, yeah, definitely um, they, they don't suffer uh, massively in terms of flexibility. Um, the thing about deer hair that is a little bit better is that it does, it does mold a little bit better to your actual hand shape. Because uh, as you use it, the hairs themselves are actually hollow. So the hairs break as you use them. Uh, and it kind of goes almost like a, not powder, but they, they turn into really tiny hairs. And that shapes to the, the, the shape of your hand a little bit better. A little bit like, I wouldn't say memory foam, but that sort of thing. Um, so there is that as a slight advantage. And of course, it's traditional, right? So there's that too. Uh, next one, how about EI? Uh, don't you interest in practice and perhaps in the future start selling EI tool swords? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not interested in practicing EI at all. Um, I've tried it, wasn't really into it. I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the, the spark for it that I do. 
for Kendall. It just doesn't appeal to me. Um, so no. Um, about selling Iaito swords, um, I've I've considered it in the past. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I won't do it. Um, <clears throat> a couple of logistic ones, which could I could I could overcome if I really wanted to. Things like. You know, most of our shipping happens from out of the UK at the moment and importing Japanese swords into the UK isn't something I massively want to get involved in. Um, and I don't necessarily want to massively get involved in selling Japanese swords with the, the way that the law is in the UK about it. It's not the end of the world. I could do it if I really was uh, that keen on it. But I think the main reason that stops me doing it is, like I say, I don't have the passion for it like I do with Kendall and Kendall equipment. Um... So I don't, you know, I, I'm perfectly able to do it. I, I worked for a company in Japan that really was a specialist in Japanese sword and uh, swords and and sold uh, Iaito more than they sold kendo equipment. Uh, <clears throat> so you know, and and I learned about them and I know about them um, in, in a professional capacity. But like I say, I just don't have the passion for them that I do with kendo equipment, and I don't think that that's that's not. I'm not doing this just to make money. Um, you know, I'm doing this because I really care about Kendall uh, and I really want to help everybody do Kendall. Um, and I don't feel like I could do what I do for uh, the Kendall community for the EIDL community. So it's, you know, that's that's not, I don't, I don't see that happen. <laughs> uh, next one. Hi, Andy. Uh, I was watching the men's, uh, Kendall World Championships, and I noticed that some of them were very aggressive and forceful in Super Zeri Uh Sorry about the spell. No, you spelled it right. Um, and shoving the opponent down. Is this a normal occurrence? Or is that only at that level? <coughs> well, <laughs> um, you can't be too aggressive in Super Zeri Eye. Um, but the World Championships is not a good example for you to look at that sort of thing. I did. I said it. I said something controversial. <laughs> it's just not a good example, right? There's all sorts of weird things going on at the World Championships. There's some great things to watch and learn from the World Championships, but it is not the place to set as a gold standard uh, in terms of what's going on inside the Shi'ai Jaw. Um, and that, that goes for all the teams as well as the Japanese team. And uh, as, as amazing as I think the Japanese team are, the kendo that they do at the World Championships is not the same as the kendo that they do at the All Japan Championships. And the kendo that they do at the All Japan Championships is definitely closer to the sort of kendo that you should be taking inspiration from. Um, and it's, it's for a variety of reasons. And I don't think it's a good idea for me to go too deep into them, but um, there's a variety of reasons for it to be like that. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't push too much and push people down in Super Zeri Eye, all right? <laughs> okay, we're at the end. Hi Andy, thanks for your hard work in finding or making new and interesting Kendo related material pretty much every day of the week. Uh, it takes energy and dedication as well as time and hard work. Thank you very much, I appreciate that very much. Um, thank you. Um, on this week's question, <clears throat> onto this week's question, how many versions of Kirikaishi uh, or Kirikaishi type exercises do you know? And apart from the standard grading type version, which ones do you practice and why? Second question, what are your thoughts on the meaning of shuhari? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Some good questions. So about Kirikaishi, um, how many do I know? I don't know how many I know because uh, there's loads. <laughs> Kirikaishi just means basically like, um, it just means the exercise of making repeated left and right men's strikes all right it's not a specific um the way we most commonly like you said um practice the grading type version as you want to say most mo lots most places tend to practice kirikaishi with a men's strike sure men's strike men and then sometimes there's a tayatari usually there's tayatari and then uh four left and right men's strikes forward and five backwards back to um either toma and then start again or back to the uh isokuito and men and do the whole thing twice and then men and through that's the most common pattern but that isn't the only kirikaishi and there's plenty of places and there's plenty of senses like i i, I know of a lot of old senses like that i used to practice with in japan when they say kirikaishi the number of 
the number of left and right men strikes isn't decided. You just keep doing it until they say they sort of give you the signal to stop, for example. Um, and then, yeah, there's loads of other types. But some of the common ones, <clears throat> obviously, there's the, the main one, shall we call it, where, like you said, you do the four forward, five back, and you do two sets of that. Um, the other ones that um, I like to use are like... Uh, some kind of e extended kirikaishi or encho kirikaishi so things like um like 30 times or 40 times so men tie one two three four five six seven eight nine ten up to 30 or 40 men and then men and through is one way I quite like that um i like doing uh kirikaishi in like one breath, toiki kirikaishi. So you just do one set. So men, tai tai, four forward, five back, and then men and through, but the whole thing in one breath. That's quite a good, useful one. Um, or if you've got the long haul, you can do like the oikomi kirikaishi, where you men and then do like the sayu men all the way down the hall. Uh, and then back again if you've got the energy. <laughs> um, that's a good one. Uh, another one that I've uh, used um, as well, which I quite like, um, is like Kirikaishi with Suriachi in it. So um, we would, you need a quite a long haul usually, but you'd start one end of the haul and you do the men, Tayatari, and then uh, Sayumen all the way to one end and then back. And then you come back to Isoku Ito no Mai with your partner and then just with Suriashi as fast as you can, both your receiver would go back and the attack will go forward all the way to the end of the dojo and back again, just trying to keep their mind, okay? Not using the shin, I just ash the back, uh, this way and back. And then the second set, do the same. That's quite a good one. Um, yeah, there's loads. <laughs> Kirikaishi is great. It's like the best, uh, you know, um, Exercise and candle for pretty much everything. So that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> Shuhari, well, Shuhari is um, it's really mm, difficult concept. Um, I've got the book, <laughs> official guide for kendo instruction, available at kendostar.com. And uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a glossary dictionary type section in the back. Um, and I think it, actually describes the concept really really well and it goes it, it follows on a little bit from the earlier question about developing your own kendo style it says shuhari uh shuhari the teaching which explains the level of training in kendo the levels of training in kendo sorry shu is the level where one obeys the principles of one's master and learns them solidly all right so you learn the basics you develop the uh, foundation and you follow everything to the letter as much as you can all right and that is like at least up to third dan though i could see it also actually i'd probably say it's probably up to fifth dan um in kendall actually um how is the level where one adds one's own ideas to what one learned in the previous level level and develops one's own techniques? So that's where you start to develop your own techniques. So not your own techniques in terms of like you found a new secret waza or something like that. It just means that like based on the everything you've learned up to now, you're able to kind of add your own ideas to it, to how it works for you. Uh, and then D is the level where one rises above uh, what one has learned uh, in the previous two levels and further develops one's techniques and establishes a new personal style. That's probably like Hachidan, isn't it? <laughs> That's where you kind of like you, you've got to the point in Kendall now where you're kind of at the spear tip in a way and, and you are after you know, going through the whole process, you're now at the stage where um, you're actually fully developing your own sort of approach to Kendall as a whole. Um, so, yeah. Um, the kanji is, uh, she is protect. And then uh, hat is uh, to break away. So it's like to kind of break from that. Uh, and uh, this, I think, is to separate. 
So yeah, um, so essentially, what it's what it's about is is throughout this the your Kendall lifetime, you start by developing training the basics, follow what your teacher says, and build the foundations. Yeah, then you start to interpret that and develop your own kind of style and then you start in the final stage after you've kind of done all that you use that knowledge to kind of carve your own path forward in a way <laughs> if that makes sense that's it thanks for joining me today don't forget to like share subscribe ring the kendo bell after you click subscribe a bell appears it makes you better at kendo haven't said that in a while. Just don't want you to forget. I'd hope you know, by the way, like if you're watching this and you haven't subscribed, what's going on? What's going on? Like I looked in the analytics thing and like 30% of you have subscribed and six, 60 or 40, I don't know. I can't remember the numbers, but like 30 and 70%, it was like 32, 68 or something. Hadn't subscribed. What's that about? Get subscribed. Ring the bell. Shop at Kendall Star. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>